Hello everyone. Today I'd like to introduce Martin Fitzgerald Staunton. He relishes the role of general assignment reporter and has even spent some time embedded with troops in Afghanistan. Martin has covered crime, consumer issues, government, the military, and also politics. He also has extensive investigative experience in reporting. Martin brings nearly 30 years of broadcast experience to the WSAV News team. So now I want to extend a warm welcome to Mr. Martin Fitzgerald Staunton. Thank you. How are you doing today? I'm doing. I feel very welcome. <laughs> I do. How are you? I'm great, actually. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, I enjoyed listening to you speak at the Lunch and Learn today. Thank you. Now, to get into it, I, the first question I want to ask you is, can you explain to us the difference between writing for radio versus writing for television news, especially to our mass communications department here at Savannah State University? Yes, and there is a big difference, and they should note the difference. Always remember when you're talking about broadcast television or broadcasting an image that your words support the pictures. In radio, your words are the pictures. You can use sound, like natural sound, if I'm doing a story about, I don't know, say they're gonna um, renovate Daffin Park. Mm -hmm. I might use, in radio stories, I would use sounds of maybe the birds and maybe sounds of the construction work that's mm -hmm. going on, you know, that beep, 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 where the truck goes backwards. All of those paint a mental image for you when you're listening to the radio. But in television, you're soaking in the image first. So your words need to set, need to, support those pictures like um for example um say i'm doing the same story daffin park renovation i would open up with that same natural sound but you would see that truck backing up boom 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 they're reversing the role of the park here the park is in for a renovation that way what i tried to do and it's advice that i got from what i called at the time an old timer now i'm the old timer regurgitating his advice it's good in broadcast television, right to the four corners of the picture. Mm -hmm. Look at that composition of the frame, right to the corners of the picture, and then that way you will cover the whole image and it makes a more powerful impact for the viewer. That's interesting that you say that because I actually am a commentator for Tiger Eye News here at okay. Savannah State University, and there was no commentator before me. I actually talked with uh, Tracy Haynes and he thought it'd be a good idea of giving me somewhere to right. start as far as um, broadcast because I was a little in between uh, concentrations. Okay. I'm a public relations concentration at this point in time. But um, he was telling me, you know, make sure your words match the picture. Right. You know? If you say monkey, we should see monkey. <laughs> you can't say monkey and then we see Daffin Palmer. Right. It has to, and, and, and there's a subliminal message there too that drives home the point with the viewer. And he does a great job of that, especially watching him do his videos. And also, not to jump to right. different yeah, it's things, fine. but um, I've also done a little bit of radio mm -hmm. experience here um, with um, Mr. Carter. Mm -hmm. And um, the doing uh, radio, I had to recite a poem, and he told me, just do it like you're talking. You know, you don't want right. to, it's a different language. It just lets you know there's a different language for different things, and there's a way that things should be said, or, you know, things that should be, like in broadcast, things that should be covered when you're showing certain pictures. You want the, your words to match with what's going on in right. those images. Um, so you've said that writing has saved your life. What do you necessarily mean by this? Um, when I say writing saved my life, I mean that I could have gone crazy and easily could have began abusing substances or literally lost my mental capacities and had a breakdown. And who knows, people who could get as depressed as I have, there are people who've been in my position with multiple losses in their life and they kill themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, I never contemplated suicide, but my losses were great enough that I felt for a moment, even the fleetest moment, what am I gonna do with the rest of my life? What am I here for? Why is this happening to me? And it was writing that allowed me, A, to get those thoughts out of my brain mm -hmm. and onto paper where I could stare at them and I could see the reality of where that would lead. And so it literally helped me maintain my sanity after my wife died in that very difficult year of 2012. It's funny because, well, it's not funny, but it's kind of, ironic that you said that writing saved your life because I feel like in a sense I can kind of relate to that um, being a college student and discovering yourself mm -hmm. uh, can often lead a person into depression because right. you're not necessarily sure what especially being a 
black American. You're right. not really sure or what outlets you can identify with things you can identify with and sometimes that makes students depressed mm -hmm. because they don't necessarily know what they can relate to and then finding yourself and creating an in our identity for yourself is also a task within itself so writing I feel has saved me in a lot of instances because it serves as an outlet for me to be able to write down those feelings write down why I'm feeling that way right. and just doing poetry you know exercises to express myself and make myself feel better and sharing them with friends just you know just to get some support right but I can definitely relate to you on that um, subject um, what writing skills must a person have if they want to be qualified to obtain a career in journalism um a, you have to have a solid, strong command of the English language. You have to know if you have a dangling participle. You have to know if you're mm -hmm. using a double negative. You have to know when to use an apostrophe. You definitely need to know the rules of capitalization because the rules of grammar don't just apply to what we're saying in the writing. It applies to what we see when we put a person's title under their name, General Colin Powell. Do you know the right um, abbreviation for general, where the period goes, what gets capitalized? That's text mm. that goes on. So we're actually sharing. And the minute we get that wrong, we lose credibility. And credibility is everything in news. And so part of being credible is knowing the English language. You have to not only know it, you have to recognize it because you're going to run into other people who mm -hmm. don't know it. They'll be like... You know, they'll write something like, I'd be go doing good. <laughs> it's like, what? Well, this is not this is not Oakland news. <laughs> this is like English language news. I used to be, I actually had this happen to me. I was in the store, and that's a terrible habit, I know, but I smoke. Mm -hmm. And um, so I order my cigarettes at the convenience store. And I ask the young lady, I say, may I have a package of cigarettes? And immediately the dude in front of me goes, dang. That's the whitest sounding black man I've ever heard. And I didn't know that um, there was a certain sound to being black, but if <laughs> using proper English or just, and I only said package because I didn't want to say pack. You know, I like to break it up like that. I use my vocabulary. What's good of using, having words and not using exactly. them. Exactly. And so I try to use them. And But in that instance, not only did he make the scene at the counter when we got out, when I got outside the store, whom, whomever he was with, and he was a scrub because he was getting in the back seat of a car full of girls and he wasn't driving. And he was riding in the back. And he's like, look at that dude. That's the whitest sounding brother I ever seen. It made me angry. Um, just in that, you know, A, I can't help how I sound. But um, B, there's nothing wrong with using proper English. And, you know, people actually, I, I know people who know the right things to say, but they say the wrong things yeah. so that they can be cool around the people that matter to them. And, um... I don't know. I'm just not down with breaking those rules of grammar just to impress somebody. That doesn't mean that you're hip. It just means that you're wasting your money and time on your education if you do it wrong. Right. I understand that now. My mom is an educator, mm -hmm. and when I'm at home, you know, you're within the... She corrected you all the time, right? Yes, and it drove me crazy. But then, at this point right now, I realize why she's done it. Because once we speak and we text like that, it becomes embedded in our unconscious. And you can't... It is so hard to shed a bad <laughs> really habit. Is. Easy to pick up a bad habit. It's very hard to get rid of them, especially in writing. And some people use cliches like crutches. And some people butcher the rules of grammar and punctuation like it doesn't matter. And then they forget. And then they can never get it right. And I'm telling you, editors and executive producers will get tired of that, especially once it actually makes air. There should be two or three sets of eyes that sees a script before it ever makes air. But in those instances, when those type of mistakes get through, you only get a few chances of making that and they will fire you. Right. I find myself very... I I don't necessarily want to say that I get frustrated, but it is frustrating, especially when you interview people, because yeah. I interview people, and especially when it's students, and their grammar is poor, it's po so poor that I'm just like, maybe I won't use this take, maybe I won't use this. And isn't that such a shame that a lack of the command of the English language would keep you from sharing your thoughts and ideas with the masses if that's what you want to do, especially if you're a mass comm major, you're a mass comm major and you can't communicate on an individual level <laughs> properly, that's a problem. Mm. Mm. Oh wow, that just really hit home. Okay. <laughs> What was your experience like being in the war zone? Can you tell us some stories about your experience in Afghanistan as a reporter? I can. Um, 
this trip was to show people, I was working in West Virginia, and it was to show people um, what West Virginians were doing in Afghanistan. So the local Air National Guard arranged for us to fly over there with them. It was a three week trip. And the interesting thing was that this unit flew C-130s. They're not like the jets that they can fly out of Hunter or Fort Stewart. These, those jets, you can get on here at in Savannah, mm-hmm. and you get off the plane in Saudi Arabia because they can refuel in the air. These West Virginia planes only had about eight to 12 hours of fuel. We were talking about Southwest Asia. It took three days to fly there, and we had to cross the ocean, refuel, cross the ocean, cross you know Europe, refuel, fly into Turkey, refuel, then fly into Afghanistan. So it was four days getting there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was four days getting there. One day extra because the planes are old. They needed maintenance work. So these C-130s take us over there. And the whole way, um, it's crazy. Because when we get on the plane, I knew it was going to be a long ride. So I brought a bunch of DVDs for my laptop. Well, my buddy from another station, he bought a bunch of DVDs too. But the first plane, the first movie he wants me to watch is We Are Marshall. Do you know that movie? Mm-hmm. It's a plane crash movie. Oh, oh. And we're getting on a plane. Not a good idea. So I wouldn't, Yeah, I, I was down and actually when I fell asleep and I was telling oh, him no, that. when I was telling him no that I didn't want to watch that movie, what happens? I have a dream about a plane crash. Oh gosh. And then we were captured by the um, Taliban. And it was so funny that I survived and the guy who offered me the movie, <laughs> Lord forgive me, but in my dream, I watched him behead him. And I was scared. I mean, that just set the tone from day one for this movie. I mean, for this trip, because um, part of why I went was 9-11 was so personal for me. Mm. I have an aunt that I love dearly if I had to pick a favorite aunt, and I have dozens of aunts. She would be the one. She'd been fighting cancer in um, 2001 all year. They thought she was going to die at two two different points in the year. It was colon cancer, and it was terrible. She survived. Well, she went back to work on September the 10th. She worked in the World Trade Center, South Tower. Hmm. So I'm at college. I was back in school at that moment. I'm getting on the elevator, and I'm thinking, huh, I don't remember seeing a movie with the World Trade Center on fire. That must be a different kind of King Kong. So I get on the elevator, I go to class. When I get to the class, that's what's on TV. Hmm. And I immediately say, I can't stay. And the instructor said, what's wrong? I said, because I have an aunt that works in that tower that's on fire, and she just went back to work yesterday. I've got to go try to reach her. It took all day. We didn't hear from her until 8 o'clock at night. We knew she was dead. She witnessed the planes hitting the building. She watched the people jumping out the windows. And she said that's the one thing she can't forget. Mm. It's easy for her to forget the explosion of the planes. It's the sound those bodies were making when they were raining down. And people forget that that was happening. Mm. That the people had to jump out of that building, burn up or jump. Really? I took it very personally. That's why I went to Afghanistan, because I literally went the next day after 9-11 and tried to sign up for this very unit that I was with. So I was thrilled to have the chance to go and see what they did. And basically what our guys were doing from West Virginia, they flew missions into what they called the FOP, Forward Operating Positions. That's the point where our military When you go out beyond where their perimeter is, that's where the Taliban is. That's where they engage the enemy. And so um, their job when they get to Afghanistan is to fly what they call beans and bullets, Mm -hmm. food and supplies out to those forward positions and back. The flights are very short. It takes about 45 minutes. But Afghanistan has such a rugged terrain that if they were going to get into a land vehicle and make that same 45-minute trip, it would take three days. Here's the other problem with Afghanistan, what's going on the ground, is that when the Russians were there, they left so many landmines, so many, that if every single Afghan person, and there's 18 million of them, I do believe, maybe 20, if every single one of them stopped what they're doing right now, right this very instant, and started collecting landmines, and each one of them found one landmine an hour, every day, seven days a week, for the rest of their lives, they still couldn't pick up all the landmines the Russians left. So getting there on the ground is dangerous because of the landmine, not to mention the infrastructure. The roads look like goat paths. It would take three days to drive, what took us 45 minutes to fly. And when you see the locals, the ones that I did encounter, for African-Americans, easy for us to recognize 
hate based on just looking at you. Hmm. I don't think it holds the same for others, but still, when you see that type of hate in someone's eyes, you recognize it. And I saw it in all of the locals' eyes. I mean, the guy serving me breakfast looked like he could as soon cut my throat as he could be giving me the eggs. And I asked the um, colonel, I said, why are there so many of these people who look like they want to kill us working on the base? You know, I thought Army soldiers served the food. I thought that was a job, a MOS, a military occupational. I thought it was a job. They're like, no. Our guys fight and do other things. All those little menial jobs like cleaning the latrines and all of this stuff, and that falls to locals. We go into areas and we hire locals to do that. So they actually, in many cases, have had the enemy working on the base with them. It's a very dangerous thing. My impressions of the bravery of our men and women serving in the military, it grew exponentially. But it was one of the most terrifying things I ever did. Because I know that if they capture you, they will cut your head off. Not say, oh, I'm going to cut your head off and then smack you on the wrist. They cut heads off. Okay, just to piggyback off of the communications uh, theme questions, in what ways do you suggest that students, especially journalism and mass comm students, enhance their writing abilities as well as grammar? Let's add that in there. Um. If you don't remember the rules of grammar, go back and get a book and just look it up. They make several very quick, easy references to handbooks. And here's the rule that I like to use, and it works. If it doesn't sound right to your ear, then it probably is wrong. Mm, okay. You know, you might like saying it. She be tripping, but she is tripping. Mm -hmm. She's not be tripping. You know, there... But if you grow up around that, then it would sound natural to you, right? right? right. So you, know, you have to check yourself. Just by being in college means you're looking for a higher education. Use the education portion and make sure that your grammar is tight. And um, what was the other part of that question? Um, enhance their writing abilities and grammar. The best way to enhance your writing ability is always in the rewrite because you always want to simplify. Some of the best writing is simple because when it's simple, it's easy to comprehend. There's nothing, and you yourself know, have you ever read something and then go, huh, and you have to go back and reread it? Mm -hmm. You never want your reader to do that. If they have to reread it, then it wasn't clear. Mm. If it's clear enough to pick up on the first time, then it's a pretty good sentence, no matter whether it's about broadcast journalism or whether it's about you know the lady in the blue bonnet at the church festival okay um now you said that many people have said that you are a wonderful journalist and reporter what natural quality sets you apart from other reporters all right a i'm nosy <laughs> very and i'm not ashamed to ask any question of anybody i could call president obama at three o'clock in the morning on his daughter's birthday <laughs> Just as easy as I can show up at a marshmallow festival and, um, you know, have fun with the people, you know, making fluffer nutter. Um, I like people. And so um, it shows. And that's what I think really helps me and separates people. And the other thing is my love for my job and the honor of being an honorable journalism shows through. And I let it show through because it is a great job. Hmm. It puts me on the front seat of the world. When stuff happens, I'm one of the first to know. I'm one of the first that gets to tell other people. Plus, I kind of get to get in other people's business. Right. I mean, I know I need to not be, but, you know. <laughs> Who else? <laughs> <laughs> As a reporter, what are the most important steps of your writing process? Um, comprehension, first and foremost. Okay. When I say know your subject, I have to know what I'm reporting on. I can't report, and I see many reporters do this. Many journalists do this. They'll try to write a story about something they don't understand. How can you possibly explain something that you yourself don't grasp? The first step in the process is understanding what I'm writing about. Once I have that, then I just like you learn in your writing syllabus, I'll write an outline. I'll go, I'll do it in my head or what I've been using anymore is I love that talk and texting. You know, I can talk and send myself an email. It's like I got a secretary. I'll be like, and so like today, for example, 
Five people detained following a clandestine lab found on the inside of the Midtown <laughs> East 63rd Street, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. I can dictate my whole story and then push send and I haven't had to type anything. Then I can go back and copy and paste and revise it. So I'm typing just a little bit. Not only does it help me get it out on paper and get that very important, whatever I write, I always write a rough draft. It's never, the rough draft never gets turned in. There's always a rewrite, mm -hmm. whether I'm writing a letter Mm -hmm. Whether sometimes even when I'm writing a text to my fiance, oh I love you, honey, you know, roses are red, violets are blue, ooh, 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 I love you. I don't like that ooh, ooh, ooh part. So when I go back, <laughs> I will rewrite a text, girl. I'll rewrite a text. And so um, the rewrite is very important because that way we can condense and make it simple. Going back to the point of easy to understand. To me, if I'm successful in writing, I've written it once, they've read it once, and they got 100% comprehension from what I wrote. See, that's one thing that I've grasped is rewriting, which is one of the most important parts of the writing process. Mm -hmm. um, because I wrote a poem, mm -hmm. and I was just so... I was just anxious about getting it out mm -hmm. and I just sent it to the person that requested the poem and I ran it past my um, family at the last minute uh -huh. and they were like, oh, it's good, but you know, you're writing it for this event and you don't want to make them feel like, because in a sense, my grandfather was like, it's kind of like you're belittling the people that you're, you know, that asked you to do right. the event. So I was like, oh my gosh, I sent this poem. Because you see his point when he pointed I that did. out. Okay. I did. And you don't see that unless you go get other people to help you to revise and look well, at you your know paper. What? Here, mm -hmm. let me share something mm -hmm. to you with you that I didn't tell anybody in that um, workshop just now. Mm -hmm. And I should have, because it's important. Read it out loud. When you're right. done, don't just look at it and think, oh, this sounds good. Let your ear hear it. Soak it in so that you can, A, listen for bad grammar. Mm -hmm. You can also hear if something doesn't sound kind of like what your grandfather was saying. If you could be condescending. Because the other point I didn't make is that, especially if you're writing something that you're going to be speaking to people, mm -hmm. which you do when you're in a broadcast journalist, when you're a broadcast journalist, you need to know your audience. Mm -hmm. And one of the last things you want to do is offend them. Because mm -hmm. guess what? They become an ex audience. If you want them to read the next thing that you've done, if you've offended them, then um, they're not going to be nearly as inclined to do so. Mm. Unless you're giving away free money. That's, that's, that's something that I've, I've learned now. <laughs> like, okay. I Lesson learned. Know your audience. <laughs> exactly. Can you describe the importance of presenting factual information when reporting? And what could happen if a person does relay false information? Well, depending on the level of the falsehood of the information, you can be sued for, um, I always get them confused. Okay, for libel. Mm -hmm. Libel is written knowingly with malice writing something to damage someone's reputation right. is basically the essence of libel and you've caused basically kind of what i explained irreparable damage you can mm. a person can build their reputation over a lifetime and then a good reputation and then lose it overnight mm. now we don't know whether they're true or not but a perfect modern day example of that is this time last year if you'd have asked me to name one of the most respected and beloved television father figures in the world mm. ever, who would we talk about? Bill Cosby. If we mention him today, even if all of those women, if all and all and all of those women are not being truthful, does he ever get his reputation mm -hmm. back? Another example that is really true, do you remember, you're probably young, but you may remember, they held the Olympics in Atlanta. Mm. You knew that, right? I did. Okay. Was in the Atlanta, yes, it was 96. And in those Olympics, there was a terrorist attack. Mm. The FBI leaked the name of a suspect that wasn't the guy. Wow. And to this day, there are people who believe that that man, Richard Jewell, is the Olympic Park bomber. And he was not. Mm. But they pointed the finger at him early. And what came out of that that still lives on today in law enforcement was it was the first time ever I heard and many heard that they didn't call him a suspect. He was quote, a person of interest. Mm. No one had heard that phrase before Richard Jewell, but Richard Jewell rightfully won a lot of money for them. 
misidentifying him. So the point being, it's important to be factually right so that you don't get sued, but also at the end of the day, a real honorable journalist just wants to get the facts to his readers or his listeners or their viewers. And um, they want to get it right. They want to get it right the first time. And I'm one of those. Okay. Okay. So what advice can you give to students who are currently pursuing a degree in mass communications and journalism? A, you have to ask yourself that if you're doing this for the money, that's the wrong reason. Most journalists don't get rich. Some of them do. Some of them make very, very, very big money. But for the most part, um, teachers make more. If you're in a small market, depends on the size of the city. But you can't do this job or any job mainly for the money. It's the wrong reason to do it. You're going to find very little satisfaction because even when your bank account is fat or even if it never gets fat, it's work satisfying work is about more than money so mm -hmm. don't expect to get rich but expect to meet a lot of interesting people expect to make a real difference in your community expect that sometimes every once in a while you can be a real hero to someone who has no one else to turn to except for someone who can help them with their problem and journalists absolutely can do that because when you ask policymakers and people in power the right question when they're especially when they're stepping on the little guy oh they get to fixing stuff very quickly <laughs> and nothing feels as good as standing up to a person who was elected to an office and holding their feet to the fire to make them live up to a promise. Mm. And um, I once had a man who was a governor tell me that I had more power than he did. And I said, I don't understand, Governor Wise. Why do you mean I have more power? How can I have more power than you? You're the governor. Mm -hmm. He says it's simple because you have the power to change a person's mind in an instant. I can talk for hours and never do that. But they can look at one report from you and in a minute and 30 seconds, you can change their mind. Wow. wow. And that is real power. That really is. Oh, wow. <laughs> in what ways can constant practice in writing benefit you in your career? In what ways do you believe it can be true in any career? Kind of what you just said to end that question. It's true in any career because... Mm -hmm. in I begrudgingly, and I mean begrudgingly, use this cliche, but it's true. Practice makes perfect. The more you do something, the better you get at it. And um, is there a such thing as too much practice? There is when the thing that you're doing no longer brings you joy in the practice. Most people do the practice to get better. And when they realize, ooh, I've got to this point, no, this has made me better. Now. Writing is a little bit of a different animal. It's not like, you know, shooting free throws or hitting home runs or practicing the high hurdle. Mm -hmm. um, but it does take practice and it does take some muscle memory, not just in forming your fingers around a pen or curling them over a keyboard. In the muscle power it takes in your brain to stretch for the creative. You need a strong, strong vocabulary that's, you need to learn a new word every day mm. or two or three words every day and not just learn them. You got to friggin' use them. You have to use them. You know, what's the point of knowing what a prevaricator is if I never say or use the word? What's the point of knowing any word that's a synonym if we're only going to use those? That's where cliches are born from the overuse of the same old thing. What makes writing so cool is if you really put your mind to it, you can write something about how beautiful the sky is. I bet over the years, poets and songwriters and anyone who's written have spent volumes on how beautiful the sky is, but you or me could sit down and really put our mind to it and write an original thought about the sky. That's what makes writing beautiful, that if you do it right, then it is original. It's funny that you said that about um take finding one word and implementing that into your vocabulary mm -hmm. over time because uh my grandfather i think is basically a part of his daily routine he'll send an inspirational message and then he'll send a word the definition and the link for the dictionary.com you know nice and Very he does nice. it every single morning like sometimes i just like oh okay skim over it then i'm just like okay. so how many of those words have you actually taken and used Maybe like two, but he sends them like every day. He's okay, what was today's word? 
See, <laughs> see, Grandpa's trying to help you out, really expand is. your mind, and you know it seems like busy work. But see, that's the problem with monotony, not just with mm -hmm. your vocation. Anything, if we, if our perception of it's something that bores us or we lose interest in it, we're done with that. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. That's why writing is so important. If you don't get it right, people are done with you real quick, and they close the book. They stop reading. They stop reading what you took the time to write. And if you wanted to share a message that was important, then you're ineffective if you bore them to death. So that's why the original thought and the original idea in written form is so appealing to a reader. Because so many people lean on cliches and, you know, read it before, seen it, done it, been there, done that. Right. And um, when it's new, you, you, you engage the reader. On a whole different level. I understand. I understand now. Um, in closing, do you have any advice or suggestions that you think that Savannah State University students should know? Um, first and foremost, know that whether you're a writer, a plumber, a teacher, an athlete, it doesn't matter what you are, know that you can achieve your dreams. It's not the America that our grandparents grew up in. Jim Crow has been dead a long time. The sky really is the limit. And um, it's more life advice than it is writing specific, but um, don't measure success by the bank account or by the car you drive or by how pretty your significant other is or whatever. To me, the measurement for success is very simple. Do you do a job that you love? And would you do what you do for a living for free if money were no object? Mm -hmm. When you can answer yes to both of those, you're as successful as Bill Gates. Interesting. Do what you love and then find a way, figure out what you love and then find a way to make a living at it because you generally can. It doesn't matter what it is. I mean, unless it's killing people, um, but I'm just kidding about that. You know, y'all might be ninja assassins out there. I don't know. <laughs> Say don't doubt my profession. But the point being, find something that you love to do and then you can figure out a way to make a living at it because success is measured by how you feel about going to work, not by how much money you have in your account or what kind of whip you're riding around in. Mm. Mm. Well, I thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today and You're welcome. giving Savannah State University a nice lunch and learn today, learning more about you and your experiences as a reporter and a journalist. Thank, Thank you so you. much. You're welcome.